Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on Condo Insider. Uh, this is the weekly show uh, on, uh, we're live streaming from Think Tech Hawaii. And this is a show that deals with uh, condominium living and issues that affect uh, people who live in condominiums. And uh, since over 30% of the people who live in uh, the state of Hawaii live in condominiums, we hope that the information uh, we provide is useful or helpful to you. And we thank you for joining us. Today, uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, he's a citizen advocate, citizen condo advocate. His name is Tim Apicello. And he has served as a board member and uh, on condominiums here and in his former town of Seattle. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you very much, Jane. I appreciate it. Tell, tell, tell us about yourself. Well, I, as you mentioned, I, I currently serve on a condominium board. Um, I've served over 21 years in different capacities, uh, president for a number of years, vice president, and then, you know, directors at large. And so after 20 years, you kind of see uh, some uh, patterns and... Uh, I felt it was important to um, kind of stand up for owners' rights, and but at the same time, um, I am a board member and have been a board member, so I I get a perspective of both both sides of the fence. Okay, and uh, you and I, you know, met because you were advocating for legislative change in the condo statute. That's 514B. Correct. Why don't you tell us what change you're advocating for? Well, specifically in 514B is um, a section of uh, 125, which basically um, it allows the owner the right to speak during an open board meeting, um, the right to ask a question or, or make a statement. And the spirit and intent of 514B-125 is exactly that, allow an owner to participate during the board meeting. Um, so what, what kind of change are you advocating? Well, really one of just to clarify um, some of the verbiage within the existing law to make sure it's crystal clear that uh, an owner does have that opportunity to participate. Um, there are a number of boards, I think, in, in, in Hawaii that, uh, for one reason or another, um, actually rather prohibit um, any owner participation during the board meeting. And, and, and know that there are two sides to every argument. So uh, from a board perspective, I understand why the, and how that could happen. But as an owner, I also understand that um, it's, it's critical to be able to have the ability to ask a question or make a statement. Okay. And currently now, there is a provision in, in the statute that allows a board to prohibit participation by members of the association, is there not? Well, um, again, I think the spirit and the intent of the law is not to prohibit. Right. Um, however, the way the, the statute's been worded for many years, um, there is a bit of a, a twist, if you will, of the, of the verbiage that um, allow boards or boards think they have the right to to take a vote and prohibit any and all interaction. And that's precisely what I want to try to change is some of these words that um, really do encourage, one, members to show up to their own open board meetings, but two, the ability to ask a question. Um, I think it's paramount that uh, the more owners that show up to a board meeting, the better uh, informed they are, the better the informed they are, the better that um, conflicts are resolved at the board level. And how did you get involved in this issue? Well, actually, last year I, I, I noticed, uh, I saw in the paper that there was a, um, a committee hearing for an ombudsman, a state ombudsman um, proposal. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought about it, and I thought there are a lot of times when an owner has a grievance, and it's really not resolved through any agency, uh, state or county agency. Um, it's really up to personal litigation to resolve some of these grievances. Um, there are mediation opportunities and some recent that are very, very, uh, very good, but most owners, other than litigation, really had a very difficult time of trying to resolve their grievances or, or get uh, further clarification on an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think the board meeting is the opportunity for people to bring issues to the table. And when certain boards um, don't allow communication from its owners, um, I think that is the source and the start of problems, and I think that's problematic. And so how did you get involved? Well, I, <laughs> I basically um, start knocking on doors, um, start trying to talk to people in the legislature, um, trying to look at the existing law and say, how can we change this that very clearly allows um, people to speak, but at the same time puts limitations on their, their rights to speak. 
Mm -hmm. um, no owner has the right to hijack a board meeting. Right. So there has to be time limitations that someone's allowed to speak, but at the same time, that opportunity to speak. Okay. And so the, and, and I know that you are working with a legislator now with, yes. uh, with a bill that's going to be heard uh, probably in the next session. I hope so. Yeah, 2017. And so basically, what, what kind of changes are in this bill? Well, they're very minute, actually. Um, the current law says that any owner um, shall be able to participate or, or attend an open board meeting. And then the words go, that owner may participate in any deliberation or discussion. The word may um, can be interpreted, obviously, you may be able to, you may not be able to. Mm -hmm. So I want to correct one word to say, um, shall be permitted to um, participate in any deliberation or discussion. So it's one word. And then um, there's a part in the, in the current statute that states um, that a quorum of the board may take a vote to um, possibly limit or prohibit speech. Mm -hmm. And I want to remove that one segment and replace it with um, their right to allow someone in executive session under the, you know, the proper conditions, but also make sure that someone's not coming into executive session that's privy to uh, maybe legal situation or, or budgetary situations and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to place safeguards for both the board of directors and the owners and make sure that this law has been clarified so that it can't be misinterpreted. Therefore, um, an owner's rights have been denied. So that means that if the, this bill passes, that a, a, a member of the association can go to a board meeting and can ask questions and participate at all levels of that board meeting? During the duration of that meeting, um, with time limitations. Um, okay. Not too dissimilar to what one might see at the legislature where there's a time clock and you're allowed maybe 90 seconds to make your point, or maybe 120 seconds to make your point. Um, and you're allowed that, um, mm -hmm. to, make, to ask a question or make a comment. Now, at the same time, the board of directors may not be under any obligation to, to grant you an answer right then and there. Mm -hmm. um, they're not obligated to um, solve your, your grievance right there on the spot. So it's, but it's important to have that exchange of information, that communication, so that we can A, acknowledge that there's a conflict or a grievance, but B, have the board the ample time to research it and, and get back to that particular owner. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, some boards now, they have in, in, on their agenda a portion of their meeting set aside, and it's called the owner's forum. And so th they say, well, you know, we allow participation, but you can only speak during the owner's forum. So that means if you've got a gripe or you want to bring something to the attention of the board, that's the only time you can speak. What, what, what do you say about that? Well, I, I think having a portion of the agenda set, set aside for people to speak is very important, but not 100% limited to that, that segment of the agenda. We know that there are ad hoc motions that come up and all it takes is a, for a second by another board member and potentially a very important uh, motion could be approved and part of, uh, part of the house rules or, or a financial implication or something like that. So it's imperative that someone have the opportunity to raise a question or make a comment before a, uh, an ad hoc motion is made. And so that means that, you know, if, if you're talking about, let's say that you're, the board is talking about uh, some work that's going to be done on, on, on you know, in, in the project, maybe some garage repairs or something like that. And they're talking about, you know, certain defects that have to be addressed. And well, why do you think it's important that the members can participate in that portion of the meeting? I'm glad you mentioned that because there's a classic example where um, this particular board that I, I, I served on, uh, we were talking about repair of the cast iron sewer pipes. Mm -hmm. And we were going down this road of, of possible repair and, and, and scope of work. And we happened to have someone in the audience who that's what they did for a living is they were a, um, a sewer cast iron contractor mm -hmm. that knew some of the challenges, particularly with the system of pipes we had. And had we not listened to that person, we would have gone completely down the wrong road and cost the association a lot of money. So the point I'm trying to make is there are many people in the audience that have all sorts of levels of expertise. And, and it's not that the board has to you know, take their suggestion, but they might want to listen because it could save a lot of money for the entire association down the road. And also, too, because they live on the property, they have eyes and ears 
that can bring information to the board that maybe the board members no. don't aren't aware of. Uh, you know, I, I've spent twenty over twenty years on a board, and let me say explicitly and definitively, we do not know all, and we do not you know think all. Right. <laughs> we just we are you know we're volunteer members, and no one has a, a, a monopoly on knowledge when it comes to the care and maintenance of a building. And so, the more eyes and ears you have, the better off, the better decisions you can make. I think that's true with any, any kind of question or, or decision to be made. The more input you have, now maybe 90% of it is not, doesn't pertain to the exactly the, the thing you're trying to resolve, but anytime you have more information, it, it's, it, you're going to get a better decision. Right. And so that's why you're advocating for this open participation. Well, that's one of the many reasons. I, I guess I can go on a, a more global scale, and that is, um, you know, we go back 240 years and how this country was formed, and the primary reason was that you know, the colonists did not have an opportunity to address grievances with the government that, you know, presided over them. Right. And when you have influence by a government, be it federal, be it state, be it city, be it county, be it parish, um, it's, it's fundamental right to be able to have some input into that government, mm -hmm. except for, perhaps, condo association governments. And that, I think, is a fundamental flaw to 514B-125 because it's being twisted so that some people don't have any influence into the government that influences their lives. And, 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 and as a condo owner, uh, since there is so much influence this board has on you know, your living condition, it's really important, as far as you're concerned, that members have access to the board and their decision-making process. Well, it, when you're paying monthly dues, um, be it for anywhere from 300 to uh, over a thousands, you know, I don't know how much people pay because we have all sorts of associations out here in the state. But when you when you pay monthly to an association, I think that gives you some right to yeah. make a comment or ask a question during an open board meeting. Uh -huh. Maybe that's just me, but um, you know, I, I pay for this microphone basically. Right. Okay, well, you know, and I think uh, there's a lot of people who, who agree with you, and, um, and so, you know, uh, and another part of this bill you were talking about uh, mm -hmm. was um, the executive session. And the executive session, uh, for people who aren't aware of it, is when the, con uh, the board will recess their public meeting and go into executive session because it deals with private matters that you don't want to discuss in public, like ongoing litigation or uh, some collection issues and things like that. And your bill will, would allow members to participate in executive session. And can you explain how that would happen? Right. Well, uh, you just said it perfectly. Let's say I, I haven't paid a bill and I don't want to have all my neighbors know that I, I have, uh, for whatever reason, not paid my maintenance bill for a number of months. Um, it, it would be nice to have an opportunity to talk to the board directly on how to best resolve that. And, and maybe executive session is that opportunity. Um, it's not a guarantee that I get an executive session, but the way the, um, the law would be written is that a majority of the board would allow uh, an owner into executive session, providing that there would be no information that concerns personnel or litigation or um, attorney-client privileges or... Um, the, the negotiation of contracts for an owner to hear those things which are usually privileged for an executive session. Okay, well, we're going to take a break right now. We're going to come back and we're going to uh, uh, spend more time on this. But we're going to take a, 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 a one-minute break and we'll be back. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Hello everybody, my name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on Think Tech live streaming network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. 
Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're talking to uh, Tim Apicella, our uh, citizen condo advocate, and he's a regular citizen, just like you, our listeners. And he is um, entering the dangerous foray of going into the legislature on behalf of all of you and his fellow uh, condo owners, basically to um, get them access to so that the so that the board so that that, that members can speak up at board meetings or have the right to speak up at right. board meetings. And we were talking about executive session when we when we uh, <coughs> left off. Now executive session is some place where you know where the uh, the uh, the board will recess and uh, all the members have to leave mainly because the board is going to be talking about these private issues uh, that you know typically you don't want you know to discuss in public ongoing litigation ongoing negotiations and privacy matters you mentioned one example a collection matter that maybe a homeowner would not want to discuss yeah. in private what would be another matter uh, that would that would uh, somebody that a member would want to participate uh, discuss with the board in well, an executive session? Let's say I had a health condition and I wanted to preserve my health privacy, and I didn't want all my fellow neighbors to know what my health issues may or may not be. And you, and I need to, you would not needed an accommodation. I'm going to go to the board and ask for accommodation, either with my unit or some some part of the common area that would give me or. A, them to consider an accommodation given my health uh, dilemma. Right. So that would be a perfect opportunity for, for someone to address a request to um, enter an executive session. And so under the way your bill works is if you are a member and you have a health issue or let's say a collection issue or maybe even a dispute that with the board that you would don't want to air in, in the public, you would go to the board and say, you know, I'd like to resolve this, and I'd like to talk to the board in executive session, and 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 so um, I, I it, and so they would be the board would allow to be vote on that, right? Well, um, or at least hear what you had to say, not necessarily take a vote. Um, um, at least hear what what it is that you're trying to get across. Now, I want to make sure that this doesn't somehow sidestep um, a formal grievance procedure that the association may have. Mm -hmm. Two different things, right? But they, but you, but your bill would allow a member to uh, uh, meet with the board in executive session to discuss certain issues covered by privacy or things for that you know most people would not want to discuss in public. Well, it, the existing law actually allows the board to vote in, you know, take a majority vote and allow someone in the executive session. Mm -hmm. So it's in the existing law right now. It's, I'm just putting a little clarification on it, um, and I'm certainly not really. That's not the thrust of my bill. The thrust of my, my proposal on this bill is, again, the ability to speak and ask a question and then to further define that by saying the Board of Directors has the ability and the right to place time limitations on your, your presentation to the Board. Uh -huh. Okay, well, you know, when, when we started this uh, discussion, you said what got you interested was this ombudsman bill. There was an ombudsman bill in the 2016 legislature. It didn't pass. Right. It didn't pass. But um, under that bill, what would have happened was that an office, the Ombudsman Office, would have been established in the Attorney General's Department. And that would then require the office to staff, to hire staff, and I guess to handle uh, complaints yeah. by unit owners. And, and I guess our concern is that that just creates another bureaucracy and then there's no guarantee that you're going to have uh, a, uh, an ombudsman or staff members who even understand the condo law. Right. And um, I talked to you before this show about an idea that has been circulating about having an, a voluntary ombudsman program where we have people who are in, in, in the industry like retired property managers, retired judges, retired attorneys, and, you know, who are in the you know who understand condo law and they would be the ombudsman and you know we would go to the legislature and get some get an office at the DCCA and maybe be able to use their staff to you know process claims mm -hmm. what do you think of that idea I think it's a worthwhile idea and I think um, if you have the right the right people uh, that have the knowledge and on both sides of the fence, um, being on the board or as an owner or, like you said, um, experience with condo law, 
and management, um, I think it could be a very worthwhile effort. I guess backing up a little bit is um, it was the ombudsman bill that made me sit back and think, I go, why are all these complaints going to the legislator? Le the legislature, why are all these complaints going to agencies yet not being resolved? And it really, for me, it, it capsulized into the point that conflicts are not being resolved at the meeting between owner and the board. And, and then I start digging a little bit more and finding out that there are a lot of boards. It's now I've one, one property manager uh, estimated somewhere between 28 to 30 percent of their condo boards do not allow participation by the owners. That's a lot. That's a lot, yes. That's a lot. So I'm thinking, well, if you're not, if you're not allowed to speak or ask a question, that's a frustration that, that kind of grows. Mm -hmm. And what happens to a frustration that grows? It goes to one of the government agencies, and the government agencies say, well, we don't have any authority to resolve your issue. And then you go, well, I don't have $80,000 to put into um, a, a litigation fund. So then they go to the legislature and ask their, their representatives to uh, step in on their behalf. Right. So why not fix the problem at the source? And that is at the board meeting. Right. And give people their 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 120 seconds, and try to resolve it through communication rather than um, litigation or, you know, going to agencies, public agencies. Right. Well, you know, ju just as a, 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 you know, that segues into the, the resolution of disputes. Because sometimes you have a situation where even if you're allowed to speak up or even write letters to the board, the disputes do not go away. And so, in fact, the, the legislature has a process. I mean, there's a dispute resolution process. First you do mediation, and then you can do arbitration. Mediation, there are no attorneys, or you know, the associations, if they want to use an attorney, they can. And a couple of years ago, uh, we moved, a bunch of us moved to get evaluative mediation adopted. And, um, and now it's been um, uh, approved by the Real Estate Commission, and, it's, and, and they have hired contractors in the state. And so you have, in, in Oahu, you have DPR, and you have two private attorneys who do the evaluative mediation. And, you know, the evaluative mediation, what it does is it basically listens to both sides, and you have some expertise. Uh, the neutral has some expertise in condo law, and then the, and like a retired judge. And that person listens to both sides and makes an opinion, says you have a lousy case or you have a good case. And hopefully, the, 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 you know, the, the, the purpose of the evaluative mediation is to try to resolve the dispute. Because if you've got somebody who has experience and has some authority telling you you have a lousy case, I mean, it, I would think that most people would say, okay, well, then I'll... I'll I, I agree, because there's nothing more powerful than hearing the words from this, this mediator saying, if this came to my, my courtroom, here's how I'm going to look at this bit of evidence that you presented, or here's how I'm going to rule on your, your position on this. And both sides get a reality check, and let me tell you, that brings the parties together. Right. Um, it's, it's powerful. And about five years ago, or four years ago, um, I actually was in the value of uh, mediation between our association, and it was a construction defect um, mm -hmm. uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And, boy, let me tell you, um, that was resolved right then and there that day. Mm -hmm. And didn't go you know, any further than that, because we both as the association and as the contractor, we got a reality check that maybe our case isn't as strong as we thought. Right. So both parties <laughs> said, okay, let's resolve this and let's resolve it now. Right. And now under the program that's in place now for evaluative mediation, each side pays $350. And you go to one of these uh, uh, contractors and DPR, which is Dispute Prevention Resolution, they have you know, a business in town and all of their neutrals are retired judges. Right. All of them are retired judges. And so each side pays 350 and the state of Hawaii kicks in $3,500. And so, and, 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 and not only do you have retired judges, let's say it's a construction or a structural issue. They have engineers, they have architects, on their panel as neutrals. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have a lawyer or a judge. You can have one of these, you know, uh, uh, experts. Yeah. And the, the, but the problem where, and you know, the people that have gone through it, you know, we've been getting pretty good feedback, but we have a problem. 
Sometimes we have associations who stonewall and don't show up. Or they stall, and it takes, I mean, it takes months to get them into the mediation. And so, you know, right now, what we're faced with is how do we get them into the room? Well, with any, you know, conflict resolution, it, it comes down to good faith by both parties. And, and you could have all the uh, structure set in place, but if one side or the other has zero good faith to resolve the matter, um, then maybe that's the time where you have to go beyond the mediation into litigation. And well, uh, you know, hopefully that would be the last resort. Well, we're trying to avoid that. And right. So, so one, one, one suggestion, and this is only a suggestion, we're still kind of working on it, is to say, okay, there's a statute that says you shall mediate. It says shall. And we're going to change the statute to say, if somebody initiates the mediation, the other side has 30 days to respond. If you don't respond, the initiator can proceed without you. Then there'll be a default, and the person who's doing the evaluative mediation will render an opinion. It's one hand clapping. Right. And that means if, and, 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 and so now that person who has the complaint has an opinion that they can take into arbitration or litigation. If the other side then decides, oops, well, you know, we don't like that opinion, they want to set it aside, they have to go to court and explain to a judge why they didn't show up. That's and, powerful. And, 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 and in other words, it's a sanction mm -hmm. for not showing up. And, and so, so that's an idea we're batting around, uh, going to the legislature and, and um, what do you think? It's fair? It's, well, I, I'll go back to my point is, um, even if there's a requirement to show up within 30 days, that cannot legislate good faith. And so that it's, it's the hope that both parties really, truly want to resolve that conflict. And hopefully most people do. I think most people that take the time to go to me mediation have some, some sense of good faith to try to, to resolve the matter. All right. Well, we're going to have to end our conversation oh. on that note, but I'm sure, I mean, we're going to have more to talk about after this session is over. And I hope you'll come back and... Well, and, thank you very and, much. I and, appreciate and, it. And you know, speak to us thank you after this me. session and maybe report on the success of your bill. I'd like to think so. Thank yeah. you very much, Jane. Appreciate thank you. It.